Okay, hi everyone. I'm Kate Travers. I'm very happy to be here today talking to you about one of my favorite paradigms, Neelix or language, uh, pattern matching, and why I think that it's the gateway to loving Elixir. So, uh, I'm a software engineer at the Flatiron School here in New York, and which is a good place to be continually reminded that learning new stuff is really hard. Like, really hard. And to just to give an analogy, you know, we're at a jazz club, so let's all think about learning a musical instrument, like guitar. So when you start off trying to learn to play guitar, you have these very lofty aspirations. You know, you want to be David Bowie. We all want to be David Bowie. But when you're first starting out, that is so, so far away from where you are. And it takes a ton of hard work to get there, and it's really easy to get discouraged. Without some early wins, you might give up. You might never realize that dream. So what are you going to do? You need something. You need to learn that one cool riff that keeps you going, that kind of locks you in, you're totally hooked, and you're never going to put that guitar down. And it's kind of the same thing with learning a programming language, like Elixir. So with Elixir, again, you come in, you're so inspired, you're excited about the language because of all of the great things that you get from using it, you know, these, these amazing things like fault tolerance, concurrency, scalability. But none of those amazing things, you're not gonna get those right off the bat. You pretty much, you know, you have to build and ship an entire app to production before you get to enjoy any of those awesome features. So what are you gonna do? You're at the risk of, you know, getting really discouraged at how hard this stuff is. You need a quick win. You need that cool riff. And for me, that cool riff was pattern matching. Once I got the hang of it, I was totally hooked on this language. So to start understanding pattern matching in Elixir, you wanna start by reframing the way you think about tying values to variables. So let's take this statement. We probably read this uh, as x equals one, yeah? Where, you know, we're assigning the value one to the variable x. That's not exactly what's happening in Elixir. And the biggest difference is this guy here, the equal sign. In Elixir, the equal sign is known as the match operator, and it's not assigning anything. It's actually acting as kind of the matchmaker, the evaluator. It's evaluating whether the value on the right matches the pattern of the term on the left, um, whether it's matching it in form and structure. And so if it is a match and that term is bindable, then the value will be bound. If it's not a match, uh, then it's gonna throw a match error. So let's look through a couple examples. So here, the one we were just looking at, we have this empty variable on the left. Uh, we're evaluating, hey, does this match, you know, against one on the right, it does. So one is gonna be bound to X. So here, here are two new statements, and this, this is where it's important to rethink how you think about things. If you're coming from, you know, an object-oriented world, like a lot of us, like, like I am, like a Rubyist, I look at this and I see that second statement, and, you know, that's, it's freaking me out right off the bat. But we look at both of these. These are both valid statements, and they also, they're, they're both matches. So this first guy we already looked at, X is getting bound to one. With the second one, that's essentially saying, hey, does one match against one? Because that's what X is right now. So here, the match evaluates to true, but since it's, nothing is actually bound, though, in that second statement, because you know, it's an integer, nothing get, you know, it's not available for something to get bound to it. So that was a fun one. Uh, if you do want to rebind things, you can in Elixir. Uh, so here, for example, you know, we start off binding one to X, and then the second one, we can rebound it, right, excuse me, rebind it to two, because that still matches. If you find yourself in a situation, um, oftentimes if you're writing, you know, ecto queries or something like that, you probably want to enforce a stricter match. You don't want to accidentally rebind something. And if that's the case, you can use this cool little guy, the pin operator. And so here, this enforces a very strict match against its the variable's current value. And so here, since x has been bound to one, one is not gonna match against two, and we're gonna throw a match error. Uh, let's look at some examples with some more complex data structures, like lists. So here, again, all it's evaluating is whether it matches in form and sequence, and so as long as your lists, you know, have the same length, and you have bindable variables, you know, on the left, if they match, it's awesome. 
um, you kind of get, you know, like sort of a mass ma assignment here. Excuse me, mass binding, important distinction. So this is one example of kind of binding, binding with lists. Let's look at a couple uh, unsuccessful examples. So here, as I mentioned, uh, form sequence and length, they all have to match. So if we try to evaluate that expression up top, it's gonna throw a match error because we've got two element lists versus a four element list. Uh, likewise, the elements inside, you know, these guys need to match as well. So this one's, this example will also throw a match error uh, because that second element is not gonna match. Uh, let's take a look at another data structure, tuples. And so, again, kind of similar to the examples we've already seen. These guys match up, so they're gonna get bound. Uh, tuples are also kind of a good example of how we start to see how we're gonna use this in the real world, how this plays with the rest of the Elixir ecosystem. Um, so a common pattern that you'll see uh, with a lot of kind of core libraries, you know, here I'm using an example of, you know, base and code, uh, file read, base decode, some enumerable functions. When these functions are run, they actually return a tuple with two elements, where the first one is an atom kind of displaying status, and then there'll be a message or something that you want to capture uh, with the second element. And so what you can do is you can pattern match against these to capture, you know, kind of that important message. So here, for example, you know, like uh, since base decode is gonna return that tuple, we match against it, cool. Now we've got, our now we've got that value that we were interested in holding on to. Uh, one last example uh, here. So oftentimes, you wanna match, you wanna capture stuff, uh, but you don't actually care about holding on to things necessarily. You know, maybe there's certain elements you know, in the data structure where you're like, I don't care, just match on anything. So you can use the underscore variable. You can use it by itself here, and it's, you know, this is basically a wildcard operator. It's gonna match, it's a universal match, matches all the things. And so when you use it, uh, it sends a clear signal that you are not interested in capturing the value. And you can use it on its own, but it's often helpful to name it, for example, like clarity is important. Uh, so you can name this guy, it's gonna behave the same way, it will match on everything. But if you're using this, you have to be very serious about not caring about the value. It's completely throw away, throw away, excuse me. Um, because if you try to read from it, it's gonna throw an error. So just something to keep in mind with uh, this little universal underscore variable. Okay, so those exercises were really fun, but you know, it's, it's, it's academic. Is this actually gonna be helpful when I'm you know, in my production code when I'm writing Elixir? Let's see if we can impress you guys. So we'll start with, uh, I'll give an example of a problem that's probably familiar to a lot of us in the room. Uh, displaying user display names, friendly display names, based on inputs that's been user inputted data. And so what we're looking at here, this is an example of the platform that I spend all day, every day working on. Uh, so at Flatiron School, our students will work on lessons. This is an example of a lesson page. And we like to encourage you know, a very friendly sense of community on our platform. And so one of the ways that we do that is, you know, it's friendly, you need friends, so you need to know people's names. So we like to display our friendly, you know, nice looking usernames all over the site. So you can see you know, who your fellow you know, classmates, who you're learning with. Uh, the problem is, is that when people sign up for our platform, we do not require them to give us any of this information. You, when you sign up, we don't require first name, last name, we don't even require a username. The only thing we require is your email, which we absolutely would not want to display out to the public. So, what are we gonna do? This means that we need to put some logic behind how we construct this display name. And so we'll, uh, we'll run through the logic thread. First, so we have a user record. There's no guarantee of what fields are actually, you know, populated on there. So if we have the first and last name, great. We'll combine them. That's the full name. That's what we'll show. If we don't have first and last name, we'll check for the username. If we've got that, cool. That's what we're using. If we don't have any of that, we'll default to some kind of nice generic uh, value. Okay. So that's our logic for putting this together. Uh, so I was tasked with uh, kind of cleaning this up recently. And so when it comes to representing that logic in code, you know, if I was to turn to JavaScript, I might represent that logic with something really terrifying like this. And uh, hopefully obvious, but um, for the sake of the rest of the examples that I'm gonna be showing, 
They are so contrived. They're super, super contrived so that it's supposed to look terrible. Uh, it's for illustrative purposes, not for code review. So anyway, this is a way to write this in really scary JavaScript. And it's not easy to parse, right? We've got a whole bunch of conditionals going on. You'd really have to kind of squint and read through the whole thing to figure out what it's doing. Not ideal. So, you know, okay, let's, let's try a friendlier language. Let's try Ruby. And so, likewise, you know, this guy, it's, it's not much of an improvement. I still think that this code wouldn't really pass the Sandy Metz squint test, for anybody who's uh, familiar with Sandy Metz's uh, talks. So yeah, we've got some nested conditionals. It's, it's not immediately apparent what this code is doing. So Elixir to the rescue. So what we're seeing here, this is representing those, all of those conditionals, but each conditional has been separated out into its own function clause. And so for, for anyone who's not super familiar with Elixir in the room, uh, it's kind of cool. So what Elixir does when you overload functions like this, when you define a function with the same name multiple times inside the same module, you're not overriding the functional. They all coexist as a kind of multi-clause function. And so what Elixir does is when you call this function, it's gonna start at the top of the file um, and it's gonna run through each one of these. The one where the arguments match, like it's using pattern matching to decide which one of these to execute, that's the one that's gonna run. So we'll do some very quick examples for, for this guy here. So if I had a user record um, that had a username and I were to call our display name method as it currently is, fantastic, spits out a username. And that's because it's matching on that second uh, function clause down. Likewise, if I have a record where I've got all the information, this, this person is fantastic, what a great user, giving me all this kind of friendly info. Same thing, it'll come down here and we'll display that full name. Great stuff. And then finally, like the worst, worst case scenario, we have someone who hasn't provided any of our exciting, you know, friendly information. If we call that with display name, it's gonna match on that final kind of catch-all clause and we'll show our, you know, lovely, totally awesome generic. Okay, so that's our code as is. One thing to keep in mind, so as I mentioned, uh, these multi-clause functions, they're wonderful. They allow you to kind of break that conditional logic into its smallest, most atomic pieces. It makes these things really, really easy to read. You know, all the logic is encapsulated, so if you need to make a change, you just do it in one small space because each of these functions is only doing one very small thing. Uh, it's important to keep in mind, as I mentioned, it's evaluating these from top to bottom of the module, so order matters. Uh, you don't wanna put uh, your most general ones at the top, you wanna put the most specific ones at the top, because those are the ones that it's gonna run through first. Uh, the nice thing about Elixir is if you were to try to write something like this, it would actually throw a warning. It would give you a heads up if you put something too general at the top of the multi-clause function. So, we've looked at back to, back to this Ruby code. Those Elixir examples that I showed, they're great, right? This looks like what an easy problem to solve. We only needed three of these things. But we were kind of fudging it a little bit because the code as it currently stands is not doing this part, right? The part that made this, this other one kind of nasty, we're doing those nil checks. So we need to protect against these. So back to our code, we'll see, you know, if somebody hasn't given us anything, we run the risk if we kept the code as is, yikes, we're gonna show some blank usernames, not great. So what do we do? You might think to yourself, you're like, okay, great, I, I love all these function clauses I already have. Um, so you might be tempted to reach for a case statement just to drop one of those in there. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, like, uh, so, so Brooke talked about the Elixir feel at the beginning. So hopefully your Elixir senses are kind of tingling where if you're reaching for a case statement, it shouldn't feel right. Uh, the next thing you might think to try is like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, feel good. I'm, I'll just add some more function clauses. And you'll start explicitly trying to match against the nils. So that's fine, that'll do the trick, you know, that, that code will do what you want it to. Uh, the problem is, is hopefully folks can see that this is gonna get out of, out of hand really fast, right? There's any number of permutations, you know, of, of all these fields that right now we only care about three, but this user record, you know, it has potentially, well, it could, it could be a God object, it could have tons of fields, and the requirements might change, you know, we might have to mix this up and start showing other fields and protecting against, you know, nil elsewhere. 
you know, and suddenly our, our file here has, you know, like 20 different function clauses for the same thing. So it's not great. Luckily, uh, there's another option that you have to kind of keep things in good shape. You can use guard clauses. So these are nice little uh, things that Elixir provides where you can augment this pattern matching uh, to handle some more complex checks. They, when you're using a guard clause, you are limited to a number of uh, just a small set of expressions. This is to guarantee, you know, that you keep things performative. You can't just put any function in here because, you know, who knows? Uh, well, for the, the biggest reason why they don't want you putting everything in there is because it blocks evaluation. It's not going to go down to the next function until that expression is completely run. So anyway, so that's why it's limited to only the most efficient uh, expressions. So guard clauses, they can help clean things up really nicely. And so I'll run through an example of one last wrinkle that we can kind of protect against. Uh, let's say that you end up with some bad data in your system. Uh, maybe because your front end validations may or may not have been running, and then also some back end validations didn't fail, and you had some users, when they signed up, they entered their email instead of their name. You've got bad data in the system. So that's really something that we want to protect against. Uh, not really something that you want to be showing all across your site. So what are we going to do? You know, like with, with our statements, you know, currently, it's, you know, like our nil checks aren't saving us. It's, it's going to match on that first function, and so it's going to display whatever we put in there as the first name. Once again, guard clauses to the rescue. You can write custom guard clauses. So again, custom guard clauses are awesome. They're really, really helpful. Uh, again, you don't have to reach for a case statement to kind of throw that in there. Instead, you can enca encapsulate that additional piece of logic uh, into this nice little, nice little guard clause. So there's a couple different ways that you can write these. Uh, you can write them as a macro, um, which you see here. Again, you're limited to just that set number of expressions, but you can combine them in you know, any kind of valid way. So you can end up with all kinds of different, different protections. The, you can also write them using like def guard or def guard p. This is actually the preferred uh, method for writing these, uh, because according to the docs, it performs additional compile time checks. Those sound good. Uh, so I would recommend using uh, def guard p, or def guard in, instead, of a, instead of a macro. So now, with our final version of our, of our account module, with all of our different display names, we're totally safe. We are protecting against all of this stuff. So, all right, so we'll kind of wrap things up. Uh, some of our takeaways today, why would you like to master pattern matching in Elixir? Well, for the first thing, it's helping you become a stronger programmer. It's pattern matching in Elixir. It's, it's sort of, Elixir is nudging you kind of in the right direction. It's encouraging you to write small declarative functions, these short functions that only do one thing. Uh, you're also asking for the inputs. You know, you're declaring them for the uh, right there, the ones that you want, which means that your, self, your code becomes self-documenting almost by default, which is lovely. And also, you know, it's a core feature of the language. As I kind of mentioned briefly in the beginning, you know, it's, it's used in a lot of these core libraries. In a lot of ways, uh, it feels like the whole language is kind of built around pattern matching. So if you master that concept, uh, you're kind of set up for success. You're kind of off to the races. You're ready to, uh, you know, it's, it's, it sets a wonderful baseline for then when you move on to more complex things like gen servers, you're good, you're good to go. And so that, in that way, if, once you master pattern matching, you're essentially all set, you know, you've learned your riff and you're ready to be the David Bowie of Elixir. So that's pretty impressive. All right, cool. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>